Tonight's presentation, A Matter of Trust. Our presenter, Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated, author for numerous aviation publications, certified flight instructor certificate uh, holder, AMP mechanic with IA authorization, Aviation Maintenance Tech of the Year, uh, honored by the FAA in 2008, EAA member. Continuing his uh, we, uh, monthly series of uh, EAA webinars, we appreciate him so much for Mike uh, sharing your information. I, I was looking back on previous webinars, Mike, and I think you're up to 139 EAA webinars you've been doing since uh, you've been partnering with us doing a monthly webinar. I think almost since when we started this in 2010. So thank you so much for everything you're doing for the, the webinars program and us tonight. I'm going to turn control over to you. Okay, well, <clears throat> evening, Tim, evening, everybody. Uh, from uh, uh, from cold and wet California. Uh, of course, Tim's going to laugh when I say cold, but we, we actually have a freeze warning out tonight and we've been blissfully getting lots of rain and our reservoirs are finally full after years and years of being empty. So uh, we, we we love the rain here because it's a very precious commodity, but I could I could do without the freeze warning. Anyway, um, get wearing my jacket. Um, so tonight's webinar, uh, as Tim said, is uh, is titled A Matter of Trust. And um, like many of the webinars I do, this is based on um, an actual story that happened to an aircraft owner who, who hollered at me for help. And um, it, it's uh, it's kind of an, an interesting story that, that got a little tense towards the middle and had a happy ending, but um, uh, but there, there's, there were a lot of uh, interesting lessons learned, I think. And I, I don't know how many um, um, A&Ps are, are, uh, are, are going to be viewing this uh, webinar, participating in it, but uh, this is a, be an interesting one for for mechanics as well. So the really the real question that we're going to address in this webinar is at an annual inspection or 100-hour inspection, whatever, how far does an IA have to go to verify that the aircraft is airworthy? Um, and, and this story uh, started when I got an email from, from an aircraft owner who I will call Maury for the purposes of, of this webinar. That's not his real name, but I try to de-identify these things. Um, and it was titled, Annual Gone Wrong, Please Help. Um, and, and Maury's email to me started out, he said, I have my Citabri in for annual now, and I, I feel like uh, like one of your webinars is unfolding in front of me in my wallet. I, I thought that was a really great opening sentence. I got my attention. Uh, he said, I had no issues with my first annual last year, being the first annual on, on his watch since he bought the airplane. Uh, this is the second annual now for him. And he says, but, uh, but I took it to a different IA this year and things seem to be unraveling. Um, and, and he went on to explain to me that <clears throat> this aircraft originally was uh, was manufactured with a with a Lycoming O235 engine, 115 horsepower engine. Um, it's a 1975 Citabria. And, and then in 1996, uh, the 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 engine was replaced with a larger engine under an STC. Um, uh, it was a 150 horsepower O320 Lycoming. So the, the airplane now has a 150 horsepower uh, Lycoming. And then um, in 1999, the engine was overhauled. So I presume that the, the, the engine that was installed in 1996 was a relatively high time engine when it was installed. But anyway, it was, it was made to overhaul in 1999 um, by an A&P mechanic, not 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 by a repair station. And the mechanic made a logbook entry um, the, for the uh, when he overhauled the engine. And it, uh, the, I won't go through the whole logbook entry with you, but 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 it it said that the engine received a major overhaul, and it also had a statement that all ADs complied with. So that was what was in the 1999 logbook entry. Okay, so fast forward to uh, uh, to 2022 and Mari is having his annual 
he says, my current AI is saying that's not good enough, that logbook entry, um, and that there's not enough inf information in the logbook entry for this IA, this new IA to identify the part number of the camshaft, the part number and serial number of the camshaft uh, that was installed in the engine. Now, wh why would he why would he need to do that? Um, uh, but he says, uh, I, I need I need to identify the part number and serial number of the camshaft. And to do that, because there isn't any information in the ANP's logbook uh, entry that was made when the engine was overhauled, he needs to tear down the engine. Well, <laughs> that obviously got Maury a little bit upset, and, and so he decided to reach out to me. Now, the thing that had the, uh, the IA concerned was a very old airworthiness directive that was issued back in 1963. Um, it was, it's AD 63-2302. Uh, uh, and um, it was so old that I had a little hard time finding it on the internet, but I finally did find it. And um, this was an AD that affected Lycoming 0320s with seven sixteenth inch exhaust valves. In other words, exhaust valves that had uh, stems that were seven sixteenths inch in diameter, uh, installed with a particular camshaft having this, this part number, 68, uh, 769. And, and apparently this was a bad combination and the, uh, the AD said that if you had seven sixteenth inch exhaust valves and a camshaft having this particular part number, then you had to do some kind of recurrent inspection and, and it was kind of a big deal. So we're talking about a uh, Lycoming engine. Lycoming uses these sodium filled valves. The, the, the valve stems are not solid like they are in Continental engines, they're hollow. And, uh, and they're filled with sodium. And um, uh, originally, uh, Lycoming used these valves with 7 16 uh, inch diameter valve stems. And they, they, they turned out to be kind of fragile. And uh, particularly if the camshaft had a cam lobe that's a little kind of on the aggressive side. Um, and they were vulnerable to, uh, to, to breaking. So uh, Lycoming, um, uh, switch to uh, beefier exhaust valves with half inch diameter stems um, uh, and thicker uh, wall thickness and so on. And, and that uh, eliminated the problem. Um, but these early 7 16 inch diameter uh, valves um, were vulnerable if they had uh, this particular cam installed. Um, and the IA had had eyeballed this engine and said, looks to me like these are 7 16 inch valves. And, and so uh, I need to know that this, this old 1963 AD is complied with. And I don't know how to do that without tearing down the engine and taking a look at the part number and serial number of the cam. Um, and the log logbook entry didn't have that information in it. Um, and, and it also didn't specifically state that AD 63202 uh, had been complied with it. It had a, a, a kind of generic statement in there saying all ADs complied with, but it didn't, it wasn't specific about this particular AD and the IA didn't feel that that was sufficient to satisfy him that the AD had been complied with. And, and so he felt he needed to tear down the engine. Now, you know, all of this stuff with the engine and the logbook entry and stuff took place 20 years before Maury purchased the airplane. It wasn't it wasn't something that was done on his watch. It was some uh, previous owner that, uh, that that had the had the engine overhaul. And it and never came up as an issue during Maury's pre-buy. It didn't come up as an issue at the first annual inspection that Maury had done with a different IA. Uh, but uh, this IA uh, was uh, uh, saying it was a showstopper, he he was required to uh, verify that all applicable IDs were complied with, and he didn't know how to do that for this particular ID without tearing down the engine and finding out what the part number and serial number of the camshaft were. So no wonder uh, 
Maury was feeling blindsided and that's when he uh, when he reached out uh, to me. Um, and so Maury told his IA that he wanted to consult with me. IA seemed agreeable to that and was interested in what my opinion was. Um, and my sense was that this IA really wasn't very anxious to tear down Maury's engine, uh, uh, but he was very concerned about his potential liability if if he if he wasn't. And and this is one of the things that we see in aircraft maintenance all the time is that mechanics make decisions that that sometimes seem very unreasonable or add to the aircraft owner's interest because the mechanic is concerned about uh, about liability uh, there's there's way too much um liability driven decision making uh, in, in my view and um i i actually did a, a webinar on on that some years ago and i think it might be time to think about doing doing another one about about why mechanics shouldn't be as concerned about potential liability as as they seem to be, but it's a big problem in aviation. But it, it certainly seemed to me that the IA's uh, planned remedy to tear down this engine was was way over the top. Um, it just didn't didn't seem appropriate. Um, so I I thought about this and I I told Maury that um, that if he had this 1999 a uh, logbook entry signed by the ANP who overhauled the engine, and it contained the word overhauled. That word overhauled has uh, a very uh, important regulatory meaning. It's it's kind of a magic word uh, in aviation maintenance. Um, and that if he said it was overhauled, then in my opinion, the IA um, should be comfortable that all applicable ADs, including this very, very old one, um, had been complied with. And uh, and I proceeded to explain my thinking about this uh, in terms that I hoped um, Maury's IA would find persuasive. And my argument about this was based on, on Federal Aviation Regulation uh, 43.2, which is entitled, um, records of overhaul and rebuilding. Uh, it's in part 43, so it's an, a regulation that's aimed at uh, mechanics. Um, and it talks to them about records of overhaul and rebuilding, and it states that no person may describe um, in any required maintenance entry, logbook entry, uh, um, for any aircraft, airframe, engine, propeller, appliance, or component, uh, he, he, no person may describe that as being overhauled unless a couple of things, but the first thing is using methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the administrator. It has been disassembled, cleaned, inspected, repaired as necessary, and reassembled. So it, at the very least, if you say something is overhauled in a logbook entry, you're saying that everything you did was using methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the administrator, acceptable to the FAA. They, they always say acceptable to the administrator in the in the um, regulations, but they don't literally mean <laughs> the administrator to do, or they, they mean it's acceptable to the FAA. Uh, and so this magic word overhauled means that you did it in a way that was acceptable to the FAA, and clearly, it would not have been acceptable to the uh, to the FAA um, unless you ensured that all ADs were complied with. Um, uh, you, you, you actually need to not only assure all ADs were complied with, but you have to do everything according to the manufacturer's um, uh, overhaul manual. You have to comply with all of the manufacturer's service bulletins. Uh, the word overhauled has, you know, is a is a, a very strong word, and 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 you don't use the word overhauled un unless you really mean it, because there's a lot of stuff that you have to do 
for it to be overhauled. And if you didn't do all that stuff, then you're supposed to log it as being repaired. You're not supposed to say it was overhauled. But if you say it was overhauled, you're, you're supposed to do a lot of stuff uh, and comply with a lot of stuff. Um, and, and so in my view, the mechanic signature on that logbook entry where he said it was overhauled um, uh, means, among other things, that all applicable ADs must have been complied with at, at the time he, he made that entry. And plus, he actually said all ADs were complied with. So it, it, it doesn't take much imagination. It didn't spell out this particular AD, but it did say that all ADs were complied with. And um, you know, and since since his very old 1963 AD was obviously applicable when the engine was overhauled in 1999, it seemed to me that Maury's IA should feel comfortable that the ANP who overhauled the engine complied with this very old AD. Um, now, Maury's IA in in doing an annual inspection is obligated by regulation, and the, that regulation is 4315, to determine that the aircraft meets all applicable airworthiness requirements, and that includes compliance with all applicable AD. So uh, Maury's IA is required by regulation to determine that all applicable ADs were complied with. The question is, how far does he have to go uh, to, to assure that? Can he trust um, logbook entries that were made by other mechanics, and, and I think the answer is 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 clearly yes. The, the, the an IA in in making a determination that uh, that that all applicable ADs are complied with has to rely on logbook entries by previous mechanics who who actually did the compliance with the AD. Because if you know if an if an IA had had to verify every AD by by direct visual inspection, uh, nobody would ever get through an annual inspection. Uh, it, it, it would be a crazy situation. <clears throat> so in my view, if there was a maintenance record entry indicating that an AD was complied with, that's good enough. And if the guy in 1999 said all ADs were complied with, and he said it was overhauled, which, which, which is a very strong word, then in my view that that, that, that was good enough. I mean, just imagine the consequences if that weren't true. Uh, if if an IA annualing an airplane couldn't rely on previous logbook entries uh, that said I, I, uh, ADs were complied with, it, uh, it would be it would be a catastrophe. So Maury shared my email with his IA, and and he reported back to me. He said after some soul searching, the IA took my point about 43.2 and had reversed um, his position that the teardown was necessary, which, which relieved Maury a great deal, obviously. Um, but the AD was still a little troubled. And the thing he was troubled by now, um, and he decided he wasn't gonna tear down the engine, but he was troubled by the lack of specificity about AD compliance in the 1999 line book entry. The fact that it didn't call out the particular AD uh, or all of the particular ADs that were complied with. Um, and his concern was based on a different regulation. Uh, he cited uh, regulation 91417, actually a particular paragraph of four, uh, 91417, which is a, quite a long regulation. Um, and he, he, he cited it as a, a potential counter to the 43.2 argument and was looking for my opinion about that. So I, I knew 91417 is a regulation I'm very familiar with. It's titled maintenance records. Uh, and it's in part 91, it's not in part 43. So the, the fact that it's part 91 means it speaks to aircraft owners and pilots, it doesn't speak to mechanics. Mecha if, if, they want, if the FAA want to speak to mechanics, they put it in, in part 43 and sometimes in part 65. If they want to speak to pilots or aircraft owners, they put it in part what, 91. And uh, this is a part 91 regulation uh, and it's titled maintenance records and it defines what maintenance records an aircraft owner must keep and how long the aircraft owner must keep them. 
Uh, so it's an, an important regulation. Um, and the specific subparagraph that Maury's uh, IA uh, cited um, states that an owner must keep maintenance records of, and this is the precise subparagraph, the current status of applicable airworthiness directives um, and safety directives. Safety directives apply to, uh, to SLSA, so they're not relevant here. But the, the current status of applicable airworthiness directives, including for each the method of compliance um, the AD or the AD or safety directive number um, and a revision date. So the 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 owner is required to keep records of each individual AD compliance and that record must include the the number, the revision date, and the method of compliance. Um, and and the, the the reg requires that aircraft owners keep those records. And um, also, if the AD is a recurring AD, um, then they have to also keep in that record the time and date when the next action is required. So if, if it's an AD that has to be done every 50 hours or 100 hours or once a year, um, it has to call out when the next compliance with that AD is required. That's only for, re, for recurrent ADs. So the reg requires that owners keep records of all of that stuff and um, that and and also the 91417 in a different section um, talks about how long the records have to be kept. A lot of our maintenance records only have to be kept for one year, but records of AD compliance sh uh, shall be retained and transferred with the aircraft owner um, at the time the aircraft is, in, is sold. So records of AD compliance are required to be kept indefinitely. And if you sell the aircraft, you have to pass those records on to the to the new owner so that he can continue to to, to keep them um, so there there are records that that are, are relatively permanent not like a, you know records of, of repairs and annuals and so on only have to be kept for a year and you know, records of uh, of uh, biennial uh, certs transponders and altimeters and stuff have to be kept for two years but records of AD compliance have to be kept basically forever, according to this rule, and they have to be very specific. And clearly, the 1999 logbook entry, saying all ADs complied with, did not provide all the information about AD compliance that whoever owned the Satabri in 1999 was required to keep and pass on to Mori. Uh, again, because 91.417 doesn't speak to the mechanic, it speaks to the aircraft owner. And he says, this, this is the, these are the records you have to keep, and this is how long you have to keep them. Um, so the, the 1999 um, logbook entry didn't include AD numbers, didn't include revision dates, didn't include methods of compliance. Uh, it, it only said all ADs complied with. Um, which certainly doesn't meet the specificity requirement of 91.417. So the the uh, the IA had a very good point about 91.417. Um, but the but the important thing is that 91.417 is not a requirement for mechanics. It's a requirement for owners. And and had whoever owned that aircraft. In 1999, when the engine was overhauled, had he fully understood his obligations under 91417, and had he bothered to look carefully at the ANP's logbook entry memorializing the the engine overhaul, the, uh, he he would have realized that the ANP's logbook entry was not adequate to satisfy the owner's record keeping obligations, and he should have sent the logbook entry back to the ANP for do over and said, hey, that's not good enough. We, you, you need to list the, uh, every individual AD uh, by number, revision date, and method of compliance. That's that I I need that information, and it's not in your logbook entry. So please please redo your logbook entry and include all information. But but obviously the owner at in 1999 didn't do that. Uh, he he probably didn't even look at the logbook entry. Um, that that's almost always what happens. Um, be, because owners 
typically don't really understand uh, the, the, their responsibility under 91.417 and that that's not a mechanic obligation, that's an owner obligation. Um, so the important thing that I want, that I tried to communicate to Maury's IA was that, that although 91.417 clearly wasn't complied with back in 1999, that wasn't his concern. And that wasn't the IA who made the maintenance records concern. This is an aircraft owner concern, not a mechanic concern. It's a, it's a 91 regulation, not a 43 regulation. And, and that you know, there's there's no way that a mechanic could get violated for not making a logbook entry that had all that information. Uh, in theory, an owner presumably would get violated, uh, but I've never heard of that happening because the FAA doesn't really expect owners to do their knowledge even though responsibilities to keep um so owner is required records of, of all of this ad compliance information but mccann required to record all that information and that that to me that's a bug in the regs um you know if, if you hold uh the regs that describe mechanics obligation for maintenance records which are basically 439 and 4311 and you hold them up next to 91417 which is the regulation that says what what records owners are required to keep they're they're quite parallel in most respects the 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 things that that the FAA says mechanics are supposed to write down and the things that that the F, that the FAA says owners are supposed to keep are pretty parallel except when you get to ADs <laughs> And in the case of ADs, the owner is required to keep a lot of very specific information, but there's nothing that says mechanics are required to write down that specific information. Um, and so um, uh, it, to me, that's kind of a bug in, in the regulations that it, 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 the, they really ought to be, the, 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 the regs that tell mechanics what to do and the regs that tell owners what they need to keep ought to say the same thing, but in the case of ADs, they don't, and it's kind of a kind of a bug. Um, so the mechanic who overhauled Maury's engine in 1999, his obligation in terms of his, the, the, his logbook entry um, was bound by two regulations, 43.2, which said what, what you have to do to use the magic word overhauled in a maintenance record entry, and 43.9, which basically says what you have to put in a logbook entry. And 43.2, um, you know, as we talked about, says if you use the word overhauled, you have to mo basically follow the manufacturer's overhaul manual and service bulletins, and you have to use methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the administrator. And 43.9, which is kind of the general reg about all logbook entries, uh, all entries other than for inspections, which is covered by a different reg. But it says, you know, if you do any sort of a repair or alteration or uh, preventive maintenance or anything like that, um, here's what has, here's what you have to write down. You have to write down a description of the work performed, the date that the work was completed, the name of the person who did the work, and the signature and certificate number and the certificate type of the person who approved the work. That's exact, that's all you have to write in a maintenance record entry. That's all all the reg says. And by the way, it's there's nothing in the reg that talks about how specific or non-specific, how general, how long, how short the description of the work performed has to be. That's completely up to the mechanic who records it. Um, so a logbook entry that that said March 7th, 1999, overhauled uh, engine per light combing 0320 uh, overhaul manual uh, signed by the mechanic with his A&P certificate meets all of the requirements of 43.9. Um, it, it's a it's certainly a, the, a minimal entry, and you you would hope that most mechanics who overhauled an engine would 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 go into more detail than that. But there's nothing in the regs that require them to go into more detail than that. All, all, they, all it needs is a, is a data description of the work performed and a, and, a, and a name and a signature 
and the certificate number and, and this this covers all of that stuff uh, but it clearly doesn't satisfy the requirements of 91417 which is what the owner is required to keep um so you know si since there's this discrepancy in the regulations um between what mechanics are required to write down which is is quite general and what owners are required to keep which is very specific owners really need to review logbook entries uh, when they have their airplane maintained and, and make sure that they are adequate and, and meet the, the owner, owner's requirement for record keeping. And if they're not, they should send them back for a do-over. Okay, now here's the anticlimactic part. All of this stuff that we went through about the regulations, although it was kind of in a very interesting discussion, I thought, Turned out to be a tempest in the teapot as far as Maury's um, engine overhaul was concerned. Um, because uh, at the same time I was having this conversation with Maury, I, I, I discussed his predicament and the fact that his IA wanted to tear down the engine with a colleague of mine, Eric Svelmo, uh, who's a very experienced uh, Lycoming engine builder. He's been he's building engine for 40 years and uh, told him about what was going on with Maury. And, and Eric told me that um, while early O320s did use those 7 16th inch exhaust valves uh, that were the subject of this 1963 AD, uh, that Lycoming switched to the half inch valves in, in sometime in the mid 1970s. And that by the time Eric began overhauling engines in 1980s, all the engines he worked on had the half inch valves. He said he'd never, never seen starting in 1980. He never even saw an engine that 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 had the 7 16th inch valve that this old AD was concerned about. And Eric said, you know, I think it's really unlikely that an engine overhauled in 1999 would have the 7 16th inch valves. And if it doesn't have 7 16th inch valves, then the, then the requirement to determine the part number and serial number of the crankshaft doesn't exist. Um, this is a very old AD and it's, it's basically obsolete. So based on what Eric told me, um, I said to Maury, I, I think you better have your IA measure those, those valve stems. And, um, uh, and, and this time, instead of just eyeballing them and say they look like 716s, th that he ought to use a, a digital caliper and actually measure them. Um, so they uh, they did that. They they took off a rocker cover. They used digital caliper. They measured the valves, and you guessed it. Turned out that the that his engine had half inch valves, just like Eric said. They almost certainly did. So the AD obviously didn't comply to the engine, and, and the whole kerfuffle over this AD was moot. But it it took us into some interesting regulatory territory, and you know I think there's quite a bit to be learned by this little this this little dialogue that 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 we had over over Maury's uh, aircraft and the 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 IA's uh, initial determination that the engine would need to be torn down uh, so i think there's there's three lessons learned here first of all owners really need to review each logbook entry that they get to ensure that it includes all the information that 91417 requires them to keep because mechanics aren't required to to make entries that are, are that specific but owners are required to keep records that are that specific so uh, owners really need to 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 review their maintenance records and there's, there's actually another regulation that says owners need to review their maintenance regs before they fly the airplane to verify that the airplane has been approved for return to service most owners don't pay att any attention to that one either but it's it's really important uh, to review maintenance record entries, and it drives me crazy when owners leave their logbooks at the shop, which guarantees that they never look at their maintenance record entries. Uh, you should never ever leave logbook logbooks at the shop. They have to be in your personal pus custody and control for a whole bunch of reasons that I won't get into unless somebody asks me a question about it. Um, the second the second takeaway is that IAs need to trust maintenance records made by other mechanics and not feel obligated to verify everything from first principles. And, and third, and maybe the most important is, 
if any mechanic tells you that your seemingly healthy engine needs to be torn down or overhauled, get a second opinion. Don't don't just go ahead and 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 do it just because a mechanic tells you to 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 do it because uh, uh, we we really don't like to see healthy engines euthanized for 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 no good reason. So um, it was very good that that Maury reached out to me and that we were able to have this discussion that ultimately resulted in in a, in a good outcome for Maury. And and with that, Tim, I will uh, open it up for some Q and A. Okay, Mike. Good lessons there. Uh, let's start with George questions first. When you say, quote unquote, logbook entry for AD compliance, is it okay to maintain a master list of ADs and method of compliance as a separate binder of records rather than in the engine airframe logbook itself? Um, yeah, it's very good practice to, to maintain uh, an AD summary. Um, where uh, where an, I, an IA who wants to do AD research can go to one place and see all of the AD compliance listed. Um, I, I certainly do that for, for my airplane. Um, but the, the, the typical IA compliance listing um, does not meet the requirements of, or typically does not meet the requirements of 43.9. In particular, it, it would need to have a signature and a certificate number and type for, for each uh, AD. Um, and, and, and typically AD summaries don't have that. So normally when you comply with an AD, you need to you need to include that in a normal signed 43.9 entry, and then you also put it in the AD summary. Now, I, it's possible that you could do an AD summary that that was structured so that it it had a place for the mechanic signature and and uh, um, and certificate number and type uh, for 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 every AD. Mo most of the AD summaries that I see don't aren't aren't like that, and they typically aren't signed. Um, so they don't they, they don't constitute a replacement for the for the 43 now the regular logbook entry the 439 entry um, but but on the other hand if you don't have an AD summary then some poor IA at each annual is going to have to go pouring through every logbook entry that that has ever been made for your airplane trying to dig out AD compliance information and that's very time consuming and presumably would would be built. <laughs> at the shop rate for doing that plus it would put the IA in a very bad mood so yeah it's a very good idea to 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 maintain a, a separate AD summary that that lists um, AD co compliance of, for each AD and 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 also lists all the ADs that that you looked at for compliance and then, and then turned out to 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 not be applicable you know like like for example if you looked at that 1963 AD, and you determined that his camshaft didn't didn't have a part number or serial number in the right range, then it would be good to put that in in the AD summary and say it's not applicable by by uh, part number and serial number of the camshaft. And 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 then Maury's IA in in 2022 would have seen that and would have been very happy and 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 not raised a stink over over this whole issue. Uh, so AD summary should include not only ADs that were complied with, but ADs that were not complied with because it turned out that they were not applicable. Joseph wonders, do the regulations require a logbook for the airframe, engine, propeller, and appliance avionics, or does the regulation state something different? The, the regulations do not require separate logbooks for for airframes, engines, propellers, and appliances. In fact, the regulations don't require logbooks. The, the regulations only talk about what needs to be in a maintenance record entry. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the form of a maintenance record entry. So maintenance record entries could be on three by five cards. They could be on post-it notes on your bathroom wall or less 
uh, you know, more realistically, uh, they could be, and this is the way I keep my logbook entries, um, in, in a, in a uh, word processing document that, that's stored in the cloud somewhere. Um, that's how, they, how I keep all maintenance records on, uh, on my airplane, is in a Microsoft Word file. Um, but the, no, there's no, there's no requirement uh, that uh, airframe records and engine records and stuff be kept separately. And in fact, the, the reason that that has been a tradition, uh, and again, it's not a requirement, but the reason it's been a tradition is that in the event that an engine got, say, pulled out of one airplane and uh, installed in another one, um, which was, by the way, the case with Maury's airplane, I think, that, that, that he, he got an engine transplant in 1996 of, of what was, was probably a fairly high time 0320 that probably came out of some other airplane, um, went into his airplane, and three years later, it got major overhaul. Um, having the engine records in a separate place, separate binder than the airframe records, made it easy to transfer those engine records from whoever owned that engine before to Maury. He wasn't selling him a whole airplane, he was just selling him an engine. Um, and that's really the reason that, uh, that that has become a tradition, that parts that, that are separable from the airframe and might, might conceivably move to some other airframe, uh, like an engine or a propeller, um, it's just kind of convenient to have all of their records separated out so that they can be passed on to whoever purchases the the the, the engine or the propeller or whatever. Um, that doesn't happen a lot with owner flown airplanes. It happens a, a tremendous amount with 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 fleets like flight schools and stuff. They'll they'll play musical propellers and musical engines all the time. Um, but that's 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 where the tradition came from, but it, it, it's not a requirement. There's nothing in the regulations that require law books of any type. The, the regulations are completely silent on how you how you store, organize, et cetera, maintenance records. So the, all the regulations say is what needs to be in the maintenance record. David asks, my plane was maintained by the same mechanic for 20 plus years through numerous owners, through numerous owners. I considered taking it to a different shop for one annual, in essence, to get a quote unquote second opinion on the maintenance. Based on this story, I'm reconsidering that. What would you recommend? Well, um, that's, a, that's a fascinating question. Um, on, on one hand, um, I, I always think it's a good idea uh, to get multiple eyes uh, on an airplane because because different eyes see different things and uh, the the mechanic who maintained this airplane for 20 years could easily have a, a blind spot somewhere where he he you know d doesn't look for corrosion or he doesn't you know um, you know has, has has missed a crack in the crankcase or something. Uh, and a separate, a second set of eyes might very well catch a bunch of stuff that 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 this mechanic who maintained the airplane for 20 years has missed. And fr frankly, some an airplane that's maintained by the same mechanic for 20 years, the mechanic is going to just by human nature start to get complacent about this airplane because he says, "Oh, hell, I know this airplane. You know, I've looked at it a million times. I don't have to look that hard this year." Um, so it, it is a good idea to to have um, to get multiple IAs to look at the airplane. On the other hand, any time you use an IA that you've never used before, uh, you you kind of run a risk, and um, it, it's important to do a lot of due diligence on 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 the IA or the shop that you haven't used before to to ask other owners who have used the shop what their experiences has been and 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 so on um to uh be, you know before you you make a commitment to uh, to do your annual there and if if there's something about your airplane that that you know might be an issue 
I mean, let's let let's say, for example, that your engine is uh, 200 hours over TBO, and and you know it's 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 doesn't doesn't burn oil and it's had good compressions, and you have no reason at all to think that there's a problem with this engine, and you really don't particularly want to overhaul it until until it starts showing signs of of getting uh, weary. Um, but you know there are some IAs who are not comfortable with engine with signing off airplanes with engines over TBO. So that would be a really good question to ask the IA before you make the decision to to hire him to do an annual inspection. It's it's so the, it's it's important to do due diligence with any 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 mechanic that you've never used before. At the same time, it's it's a really good idea to get multiple people to to look at your airplane and not have it looked at by the same person year after year after year. Donald asks, when I've had a propeller and accessories overhauled, they add a statement in the log entry that the shop has records of AD compliance. I don't have anything but that log entry. This seems standard practice, but doesn't seem to comply with 91.413. Your comments? Yeah, and that's a, that's another really good um, uh, example of of why owners need to look at look at their maintenance records and make sure they're in compliance. Um, what you're referring to is a practice that that has always driven me nuts, and I have no idea why the FAA allows it. Uh, that that says that if work is done at an FAA certified repair station, a Part 145 repair station, um, the repair station is allowed to keep the maintenance records in its files um, and and simply reference you know the the uh, the work order number in in your logbook entries rather than putting the the details in, into your logbook entries. Um, I think that's a, that 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 is legal, but it shouldn't be. Uh, it, it first of all, it makes it impossible for the owner uh, to to comply with 91417, and and second of all, repair stations aren't required to keep their records for very long. I think it's three years or something. So if you have a logbook entry that refers to to um, a repair station work order. And you don't have a copy of that work order. The, the shop might put that work order through a shredder three years after the work was done, and 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 then it, it disappears. Um, and if it had some information about AD compliance in it, and you're required to keep that information indefinitely, you know that information is gone. So you know if if you ever get a logbook entry. From a repair station that that simply re refers to and seems to incorporate uh, a work order by reference, you need to get a copy of the work order. Um, that's another one of these 91417 things that owners typically don't um, understand, but but it's important that that you do because uh, the. The, there's a there's some fer fairly good logic to the the records that the FA requires you to keep and how long it requires you to keep them um and it's a, it's a, it's an important regulation and it but it is an owner responsibility to comply with that regulation it's not a shop responsibility so owners need to make sure that the shops are giving them the information they need not just the information that the shop is required to 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 record Gary asks do IAs need to verify that the Cessna cigarette lighter AD is complied with by clipping the wires hasn't been undone by an owner hooking them up again? <laughs> um, yeah, probably. I I I think it that that I probably gotta check that out. Uh, is is it is it likely that he did? Oh, probably not, but but yeah, in theory, I think an IA is supposed to is supposed to look for stuff like that. And it and then it speaks to like Terry's question here. I've seen numerous ADs complied with, only to find out it was not accomplished. 
for example, Mooney installa insulation inside areas was accomplished only to find out it wasn't done when they did the interior. How do you really know? Um, well, it's, it's a good point. And, and I, I should mention that um, pencil whipping in AD, which, which means writing, writing down somewhere and signing that you accomplished an AD when you really didn't is an extremely serious um, infraction uh, by a mechanic. It's one of the few things that that if 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 it comes to the FAA's attention that an I that an IA did that that it, that he said that he complied with an AD when he really didn't, um, the the FAA will throw the book at that mechanic, um, and uh, it it's a it's a very very serious it's it, it's what uh, Bill O'Brien the 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 guy who used to be the Kind of the head mechanic at the FAA for years and years and years. He's now deceased, but Bill used to call it autographing a lie was the way he referred to it. And it's it's probably the worst thing that a mechanic can do. Um, you know, if a mechanic you know leaves a hose off or something like that, uh, the FAA may slap him on the wrist, but they say, oh, you know, look, everybody makes mistakes. But if a mechanic um, um, makes a fraudulent logbook entry, particularly one uh, about AB compliance, th that's like the worst possible thing that, th that a mechanic can do in, in the FAA's eyes, and they will definitely throw the book at the guy. David wonders, are light sport aircraft repairmen also bound by 43.2 and 43.9? Um, that that is a, a a very interesting question. Uh, I I would say that the answer is yes, but but it's kind of a fuzzy yes. The the light sport aircraft rule, which is help me Tim, it's ninety one something or other two ninety one two something I think. Anyway, uh, yeah, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. Oh come on, Tim. Uh, ninety one three twenty seven. 91.327. Okay. All right. There we it go. was back there. I just needed to come forward. <laughs> anyway, the light sport rule, the, 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 for part 43 itself says that, that it's, it's only applicable to certificated aircraft. And then the, the, uh, the light sport rule, which is in part 91, says that, um, that applicable parts of part 43 apply to light sport aircraft. And it doesn't say what parts of it are applicable. So that's that you, you kind of have to use your imagination. Um, but I, you know, I, I think the spirit of the rule is, is that the, the regulations regard, re, re, regarding logbook entries um, apply to light sport aircraft, but but I can't prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt because the regulations are written so peculiarly. They, you know, the, the, the light sport rule is a, a part 91 rule, which again speaks to, to pilots and aircraft owners. And there isn't really a part 43 light sport rule. It, there's just this, this funny thing in the 91 rule that says that the applicable portions of portions of Part 43 apply, so it it it's a little bit up to the imagination. It, it, this is was not it, this light sport rule was not the FAA rulemaking lawyer's finest hour, in, in my opinion. Michael wonders, in response to your previous answer, when they throw the book at the IA, what is the extent of the impact the IA could receive? Um, normally it would be, uh, it would be a suspension or revocation of his, of, of his certificates. And the rule says that not only, not only would his IA be, be revoked, but all of his certificates, if, 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 you know, if he were, a, was a pilot and a mechanic and an IA and a parachute rigger, in, in theory, the FAA could revoke all of his certificates for autographing a lie. 
it's it's very it's a very severe uh, infraction. Vadim wonders what happens when the engine logbook is lost. Can a replacement logbook be started with an entry? All ADs have been complied with as evidenced by this aircraft passing an annual condition inspection? No. Um, the, the, it, logbooks get lost quite a bit. And, and the, I, I've had to deal with a lot of these situations. And sometimes they, they get legitimately lost. And I, the, I remember there was one case where an aircraft owner came to me and he, he said he, he, he just w went through a, a very contentious divorce and his wife, out of spite, grabbed his aircraft log books and threw them in the fireplace. <laughs> oh. Or his ex-wife, I guess. So uh, I've, I've seen a lot of this stuff. Um, and when when log books are lost, if you look at 91.417, um, 43.9 and 43.11 entries, which are are, are entries, 43.9 entries are, are entries that memorialize repairs, alterations, preventive maintenance, that sort of stuff. And 43.11 entries memorialize annual inspections, 100-hour inspections, and, and other inspections. And 43.9 and 43.11 entries only have to be kept for a year. So uh, the fact that the logbooks were lost uh, or burned in a fireplace or whatever, um, may adversely affect the fair market value of the aircraft if you want to go sell it, because buyers really don't like to buy uh, airplanes that, that with missing logbooks. But it doesn't. But they don't constitute a regulatory problem. Um, you know, w once an airplane goes through an annual inspection, nobody cares about all, any of the previous annual inspections. Uh, once an airplane goes through an oil change, nobody cares about the previous oil changes, and so on. Um, but AD compliance is a is a different story. AD compliance is a is a is a permanent thing. And as you know, as witness Maury's airplane, you know he he had a 1975 airplane. He was going through a 2022 annual inspection, and the issue of whether a 1962 AD came up. So um, this is a big problem. If you lose all the records of AD compliance. Then an AD, then an IA may say, well, look, I can't verify that this AD wasn't complied with without, you know, tearing down the engine and checking the camshaft. Well, actually, he, first he should have measured the valves and said, oh, these are half inch valves. You don't have to worry about that. But, um, but, but typically the loss of of AD compliance records is is a pretty serious issue because to get through the next. I, uh, the next um, annual inspection, an IA is going to have to verify that all applicable ADs are complied with. And if he doesn't have a maintenance record that says they complied with, he's going to have to verify that they were complied with by direct inspection. And sometimes that 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 can be, you know, kind of catastrophic. Um, uh, but so that's the situation with. Um, with loss of, of maintenance mm -hmm. records. There's also some things that we run into. For example, if the if an aircraft data plate is lost, uh, you can get the factory to issue a new data plate, replacement data plate, if if the factory still exists for that for your aircraft. But you got to go through hell uh, in order to do that. Um, mm -hmm. It's 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 quite it's quite difficult. So. Um, this is why um, I feel so strongly that a that aircraft owners should never allow their maintenance their maintenance records out of their custody and control. We never allow any of our clients to give their writ their their paper maintenance records to a shop. We scan them and we give the shop the scans. There's no reason and and, and we ask the shop to make maintenance records on self-adhesive stickers that the owner can then paste in, in his logbooks. There's never any reason that, uh, that that anyone other than the aircraft owner needs access to the original maintenance records. And the second thing that we strongly advise uh, and and that uh, that I certainly do myself is not to keep your records in paper 
but to to keep them digitally you know somewhere in the cloud that's not going to go away like dropbox um so that uh so that there's no possibility of them being lost like i say we've seen all kinds of ways that aircraft maintenance records are lost there was a few years ago there was a big flood at a big ga aircraft in southern california and a, and a lot of maintenance records were being kept at the shop which you should never do and the, and they got you know they got buried in flood waters and and destroyed um and a whole bunch of airplanes wound up with no surviving maintenance records that way so um the the best way to keep maintenance records is 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 digitally somewhere in the cloud where they're not going to go away um I guess that's probably all I have to say about lost maintenance records. That was probably too much, huh? <laughs> that was good, good. Um, <laughs> Kelly's got a good response here, though, too, that kind of counter a little bit. Reference electronic aircraft records, i.e. the Word document, says locally we had an issue where the ANPIA was keeping records electronically, and he died. We were unable to locate years of maintenance data for several aircraft, so the logbooks have holes. The cloud is only as good as your access to the information. Right, well, the maintenance records are not, the, the responsibility for, for keeping maintenance records is a, an owner responsibility. And the, and the owner is the only person in the world that ever needs access to those maintenance records, uh, or at least, um, well, I mean, obviously, during an annual, the IA needs to be able to read the maintenance records. He, he needs read-only access, or he needs a copy or something. Um, but but the maintenance maintenance records are the owners, not the shops. We, we've also seen, you know, a number of cases where an owner gets into an argument with the shop, like say over an invoice. The the shop estimated a job at x dollars and invoiced it at 2x dollars and the aircraft owner's upset and uh, and and the shop will hold the maintenance records hostage and you never want that to, that to be to be the case uh, the, you know if you if you don't give your maintenance records to the shop then they can't hold them hostage or if you don't give the originals to the shop but at any rate the it definitely should be kept in the cloud and the access to it needs to be the owners because it because the, the maintenance keeping maintenance records is an owner responsibility it's not a shop responsibility shops have no responsibility to keep uh aircraft maintenance records unless they're a part 145 repair station in which case i think they have a responsibility to keep records of the work they did for three years and they can throw it away uh and and it, and if it's not a part 145 repair station uh, then then there's no requirement to keep maintenance records at all um i mean uh, a ia sometimes will keep records of annuals that they do uh, for two years so that they can use them uh they to, as credit for their ia renewal or something um but the, there's no requirement for mechanics to to keep maintenance records uh and and, and certainly even if it's a repair station it's only a, a three-year requirement but owners have a requirement to keep much more detailed records and to keep at least some of those records like ad compliance uh, on an indefinite basis michael comments he says the owner better make sure his estate can access the logs to facilitate selling the aircraft after they are gone then yes that's true how do you, uh, Stephen asks, how do you feel about working with an owner doing his own inspection in part with the IA? Um, we're talking about something like an owner assisted annual, I assume. Sounds like it. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of, of owner assisted annuals. Um, I, I have frequently said that I think every aircraft owner uh, should should go through at least one owner assisted annual on, on any airplane that he owns because there is nothing in the world that will teach you more about both the condition of the airplane the systems of the airplane um it, it's a it's a tremendous educational experience plus you kind of you you get to to see the maintenance process in action and and you you learn a great deal about 
what life looks like on the other side of the toolbox, if you will. And so it improves your ability to interface with, with shops and mechanics uh, because you, you, you've sort of had an opportunity to be there and do that and, and, and see, see, see what the world looks like through a mechanic's eyes in a, in, in a way. Now, an owner can't actually do any of the inspection. Uh, in, in fact, um, inspections are the only, the only aspect of maintenance that um, are not uh, delegable. Um, owners can do literally any kind of repair to, to their airplane under uh, A&P supervision. They could even overhaul an engine under A&P supervision, theoretically. Um, but the one thing that the that that an A&P cannot delegate to anyone else is is the inspection. He has to do the inspection personally. Um, but when you do an inspection, there's a, a large amount of opening and closing and, and stuff that owners can do. Um, and also during the actual inspection, it's extremely instructive for an owner to follow the IA around so that the IA can actually point out any discrepancies that he finds and the owner can actually see them with his own eyes and, and know, you know, what what's going on. And um then they can have a conversation about wh whether this discrepancy is an error within a item or whether it can be prudently deferred to a later time or, you know, it, it, it's just a, a, it's a very good experience and one that I highly recommend. Now, not every, not every shop and mechanic is, is willing to, to do uh, owner assisted annuals because uh, for, in an owner assisted annual, the, 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 the mechanic, is is essentially being tasked not only with inspecting the airplane but also doing being an educator for the owner and keeping an eye on him um and not every mechanic is willing to do that but but uh, if you do have an opportunity to do an owner assisted annual it's, it's, i think it's a wonderful experience and frankly that's that's the way i i first got involved in maintenance i mean i I bought my first plane when I was 24 years old, and I was basically an appliance operator, uh, you know, un, un, until the 1980s. And then I wound up, you know, doing an owner-assisted annual, and uh, I got more and more and more involved in the maintenance of the airplane, and ultimately was doing almost all the maintenance myself under supervision. And eventually, I got enough hours to 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 get an A&P, and then three years later to get an IA. So. Um, owner assisted annual is kind of what got me into into this. I, I was a software developer, <laughs> and maintenance aircraft maintenance was was not my thing until later in life. Well, maybe that response leads to this question then by Joseph: Is is trust viewed differently with an annual conducted at a big shop versus an out in the field by an independent IA? Um, you know, I'm I'm not really sure i understand the the question um that annuals can 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 be different a little bit with big shops but i'm not sure about how that relates to the to the trust issue i was just thinking maybe a smaller shop an independent ia might be more willing to work with an owner to to do an annual uh, which is owner assisted perhaps as opposed to a big shop might be true. less likely to yeah i think that's 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 true um it's uh, um uh, part 1445 repair stations um have some difficulty in uh in in doing owner assisted annuals because they operate under under some regulations that require that everybody in their shop that's doing work has has to go through an approved training program stuff like that which which kind of leaves the owners out um so you, you'd be much more likely to be able to do an owner assisted annual with a with a, a non in a non-repair station mm -hmm. bryant asks 43.15 c12 very specific after an annual inspection has been completed, the engine must be run to check the valves for power output, uh, check the values for power output, magnetos, fuel and oil pressure, cylinder and oil temperature. Must this be documented in the engine logbook? Um, 
No, it's almost always, uh, it's, it's almost never uh, documented in the engine logbook unless, you know, unless there was a discrepancy found during the run-up. Um, but uh, the, the, when, when you do a 4311 entry on a, for an annual inspection, um, and you, you typically will say I did an annual inspection in accordance with, uh, could, could be the, the, the aircraft manufacturer's checklist, could be uh, just say I do, did an annual inspection in accordance with the port, part 43 appendix D. Um, but any you're required to use a checklist, and every every compliant annual inspection checklist includes the run-up. So you you normally don't write down every every item on the checklist that that you did. Um, you you just say that that you've conducted an annual inspection and you certify that the aircraft is has been found in in, in an airworthy condition, or that it, it if it's not an airworthy condition, you you you've given a, a list of discrepancies to the aircraft owner. So you normally would not log the run-up separately, uh, uh, you know, un unless unless there was an issue during the run-up that required you to 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 take some maintenance action. Um, you're you're required you're required to um, to to memorialize any any maintenance action that you took. Um, but doing a run-up is not really a maintenance action. It's it's a, it's it's part of the annual inspection, and and so you, you normally wouldn't uh, wouldn't document it separately. John asks if I replace magnetos with electronic ignition, and an AD comes out against the magnetos, can it be NA quote unquote, or do I need to find an AMOC? No, it. it if you have an AD against a, a Bendix S1200 magneto, for example, and and the and you determine that there there are no Bendix S1200 magnetos on your engine, then then the the AD is not applicable, um, and you you would just say uh, NA not installed or something like that. And that's all you'd have to say. Mike wonders. What's your take on buying and relocating a foreign aircraft with different maintenance records requirements to the U.S.? Um, well, that's 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 kind of a good question. Um, the, the, there are some complications uh, importing aircraft, although it, it happens quite a bit. Um, the the different requirements normally aren't a problem because most foreign um, uh, regulations are more strict than the FAA's regulations, not less strict. So uh, normally, if a if if an aircraft was maintained in a foreign country, uh, it 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 has more than complied with, with the requirements that, that, uh, under FAA regs. A uh, problem comes up if, if, for example, or you know, the maintenance records were in German or French or something, because now you have the airplane in the U.S. and, and a, some poor IA is being asked to go through the records during an annual inspection, and he can't read German or French. So that that can, you know, that can present uh, uh, something of an issue. Um, but the regulatory differences normally are not a problem because generally FAA, uh, FAA regs are more permissive than the regulations in most other countries. Richard wonders, do you have to keep every AD compliance report or just the most recent report? Um, it, I, I assume that... that the context here is is for a recurring AD. I mean, there's two kinds of ADs. There's there's non-recurring ADs, and recurring ADs, um, and and some if it's a non-recurring AD, you you comply with it once and and you're done. Uh, also, there are there are also some recurring ADs that have a way of of terminating. They have a terminating action. 
you know, for example, if you have, you know, part number X, uh, you, you have to re-inspect it every 50 hours and until you install a new improved part number Y, in, in which case the AD is now permanently complied with. Um, but if it's a if it's an ongoing recurring AD, um, I, you really only need to keep a record of the last time you you um, you complied with it. Now you know now that I'm thinking about it, the the, the, the right answer is a little bit more complicated than that hmm. because there are some ADs, uh, and, and I'm thinking, for example, of uh, uh, there's an AD uh, 2001-16, which is against twin Cessna exhaust systems. It's, I, I actually helped to write that AD back in the day, and it's a very complicated AD that 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 it's a recurring AD, and there are certain elements of it that have to be done once a year and other elements of it that have to be done every 50 hours and so when you comply with it you know if you're doing the 50 hour part you're you're, you're complying with only one paragraph of the of the ad uh the one that is has to be done every 50 hours and so you know you'd really only need to keep the last time you complied with the 50 hour paragraph but you'd also need to keep a record of the last time you complied with the once a year paragraph. And then there's other paragraphs that only occur every engine TBO and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very complex compound AD. Uh, but the general rule is that, that, that you, you only have to keep a record of the most recent time you did something that you're required to do and, and, and any previous, times you did it become moot once you've re once you've repeated the action. Tom wonders can you abbreviate in accordance with as capital I A W. Yeah, everybody does. Hmm. We abbreviate a lot and you know NA uh, PCW for permanently complied with. Yeah, we abbreviate that stuff a lot. Everybody knows what it means. Or Joe everybody wonder that's going to be looking at it knows what it means. Joe wonders if an engine is overhauled, do you need to keep the previous engine logs? Uh, yes, you do. Um, the 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 rule is that if an engine is rebuilt, and only the factory can do that, if an engine is rebuilt, then it gets a new serial number. The factory puts a different data plate on it. It gets a a, a an empty logbook, which is frequently called a zero time logbook, uh, and it starts from scratch. But if an engine is overhauled, um, which is typically done in the field, although I think Lycoming may still have a, a factory overhaul program, but if it's overhauled, it does not get a new data plate. It's still the same engine as it was before. And the, the, and the maintenance records um, have to be kept. Now, you know, when I when I say have to be kept, um, uh, obviously the the general rule is that that 11 entries only have to be kept for a year. Although, if if, if you discard them after a year, it's probably not going to be good if you go go and sell the airplane. But as far as the FAA is concerned, they only have to be kept for a year. And but but records of things like uh, airworthiness directives and a couple other things have to be kept permanently. Um, so you you you'd you'd have to you 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 the the previous maintenance record entries don't go away when you overhaul an, an engine, but they do go away when you when an engine is rebuilt. And rebuilt is only can is only done at the factory or by the factory. Getting close to the end here, kind of running out of questions. Uh, David does have one here, though. How does a home builder who has a repairman certificate deal with the requirements for maintenance? You want me to talk that's, to that a little bit? Yeah, I know, I, that's a lovely broad question. <laughs> yeah, it's the but uh, so a home build experimental amateur built maintenance can be done by anyone. You don't even need a repairman certificate. The, repairman certificate that the original builder of the aircraft can obtain is only needed to do the condition inspection every 12 months. 
any other time that maintenance, repairs, modifications are made to the aircraft, there is no requirement that a person hold a certificate to do those. Now, if the amateur built then is sold to somebody else, um, that new owner cannot get a repairman certificate. So they, um, the FAA requires an A&P mechanic do the condition inspection once every 12 months. But likewise, anyone can do the maintenance, repairs, or modifications. So the new owner, if they want to do those, they can, because to do maintenance, repairs, and modifications, you don't need to have a certificate. But then every 12 months, condition inspection has to be signed in the maintenance records, and that would have to be done by an AMP mechanic. Not even an IA, just AMP mechanic. So, so Tim, the an owner who is not a, a mechanic, um, but the owner of an experimental is, is, uh, d does the maintenance on the aircraft, um, does he have to make logbook entries and do they have to be 43.9 compliant logbook entries? Good question. Yeah, um, I think they should be. I think other people would say you don't have to. But I think that entries should be made whenever maintenance is performed, even if it's by the owner. Yeah, and I, I I agree. And if, and and 43.9 is is a very general regulation. It it doesn't require a lot. And like I say, it just says date, description of work performed, name of the person who did the work, and signature, certificate, and type. That's pretty. That's not a very onerous requirement. Right. Yep. It's just that it's just that you know uh, some when you do maintenance on an airplane, you're supposed to memorialize it, and when you sign the entry, you're 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 certifying that the work was done in a satisfactory fashion. And owners can do that. Yeah. No, nope, you don't have and to owners be an of certificated mechanic. aircraft can do that for, for preventive maintenance. Yeah, all kinds of things under preventive maintenance. I think you've right. done a and webinar the, on that once and, or twice. And the definition of preventive maintenance is now much fuzzier than it used to be because of the Khalil decision. And yeah. uh, uh, so I encourage aircraft owners to do, you know, lots lots of stuff. Attend especially your webinars, since, get educated, and do lots of stuff. Yep. Yeah, especially especially since we're in a, a mechanic crisis, which I have an upcoming webinar on, where shops are are, are now booked a year in advance. Oh boy. So if if you don't do your own oil changes, <laughs> you may be on the ground a lot. Well, with that, we've had a couple comments here. Ken just says uh, thanks, guys. Excellent. Robert says great webinar, Mike. I always receive valuable information. And Darwin says Mike Bush is my hero. And uh, <laughs> thank a you, huge, Darwin. A, a huge thank you to Mike from Darwin Stout. Well, thanks well, a lot. I appreciate it. Mike, I'm take smiling. Out. You can't you yeah. can't see it's not a video, but. There you go. We made Mike smile. That's awesome. Hey, <laughs> take a moment and share closing thoughts with us, please. Okay, guys. Uh, well, the, the usual, if, if you if you are not on my email list and would like to receive a newsletter and, and uh, um, interesting maintenance stories, uh, which I'm about to, to, to write up a few, we've had a couple of pretty interesting things happen in the last month. Um, the easiest way to do it, if, if you live in North America, is to pick up your cell phone um, and and type the word, uh, text the word savvy, S-A-V-V-Y, to 33777. <clears throat> and a little bot will pop up and ask you for your email address and put you on the list. If, if, you're, uh, if you're not in North America, I don't think that works. And so you, you need to go to the website, SavvyAviation.com, and, and click it on the link up at the top of the page to, to get on the mailing list. Or if you stick around for Tim's um, survey, which I hope you do, uh, there'll be a checkbox that you can check that will, that will get you added to the mailing list. Um, my, my four books are, as usual, uh, available. Um, you can buy them in the EAA bookstore. They just ordered a bunch more, which I was happy to see. Uh, for, you can get them from Aircraft Spruce or you can get them on Amazon. Uh, my first book, Manifesto, is available as an audio book. My second book, Engines, uh, we, we've completed the audio book. It's now been submitted uh, to uh, Amazon and Audible, and I expect it to show up there sometime next week, I hope. Um, so 
my next webinar, hopefully I'll be able to say, yep, the, the engines book is there. That was a big project because that's a 500 page book. Doing a 500 page audio book is, a, is quite an quite a endeavor. And so we're about to start working on the audio book version of uh, uh, Airplane Ownership Volume 1. Um, and uh, my uh, podcast that I do with, with my colleagues, uh, Colleen Sterling and Paul New, called Ask the A&Ps. It's an AOPA production. Am I allowed to say that on EA webinar, I hope? Uh, I think you should, and, yes. Uh, I enjoy listening to your uh, Ask the A&Ps uh, podcast. I think it's great. And the latest, uh, the latest uh, edition of it comes out on the first of each month. And since today is the first of March, I assume that the new webinar is there. I haven't actually pulled it up to listen to it yet, but um, it's a, it's it's a, basically a call-in show. It's modeled after the the old NPR Car Talk program, except this one's about airplanes. And so, if you have a question that you would like to uh, to try to stump us with, um, uh, you can email it to podcasts at aopa.org. And uh, our producer uh, Ian Twombly will, uh, if 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 your question meets the cut, we'll schedule you for our next recording session, and we'll 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 have fun with you, and we'll we'll put it on the podcast. I hope so. I hope you guys participate. And, and finally, the the next uh, three webinars that I'm going to be doing on the first Wednesday of every month, as always, um, April webinars called Ethics of Misdiagnosis. I'll, I'll be talking about. Well, it starts out talking about what happens if you bring your airplane into a shop with a with a squawk. They do a bunch of work and give you an invoice, and then, then it turns out that they didn't fix the problem. Um, and we'll be talking talking about that and and talking about how to avoid having that happen. Um, the the May uh, webinar is called "Booted Out of Annual," and and I'll be talking about uh, probably one of the weirdest maintenance things that 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 I've ever been exposed to um, that happened recently to uh, to one of our clients um, who, who basically uh, had his airplane in the shop for an annual inspection and got crosswise with the owner and wound up with his airplane getting tossed out of the shop in pieces with six cartons of parts stuck in the in the baggage compartment and and, and how we 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 helped him get out of that predicament, but that was a that was a pretty bad one. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, in June, I'm going to be talking about the mechanic crisis, which we are in, in the midst of a terrible mechanics crisis. I I did I I did a webinar back in in 2020, I think, called the looming mechanics crisis, where I was saying, hey guys, something bad is happening, and uh, it, it well it it ain't looming anymore. Uh, we're in the middle of a full-blown uh, crisis with with shops, not enough mechanics to work on on our airplanes, and shops being booked up a year in advance, and um, having, you know, when something like like this new Continental AD comes up that that requires 2,000 engines to have cylinders pulled off, um, we we just don't have the capacity in the system right now. It's it's pretty serious, and I have some thoughts about you know what some of the things we might be able to do to improve the situation but uh, that's that's what the June webinar will be about I might even have more thoughts by then <laughs> and uh, so anyway excuse me that's uh, that's all I have I didn't mean to make the screen go black like that I'm sorry <laughs> yeah. well thank you Mike. my fault my bad yeah. uh, no problem yeah looking forward to your upcoming webinars thank you so much great webinar excellent information and Everybody who tuned in, thank you so much for joining us. Great set of questions, good Q&A session. Thank you all so much for taking time to, to ask your questions. And Mike, thank you so much. Have a great night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming.